I don't believe God has to determine my actions in order to know them. I think that's what is supernatural about his infinite qualities like omniscience. Without grasping the implications of the creator-creature divide, there will be no way for us to understand how the sovereignty of God is consistent with the moral responsibility of finite creatures like ourselves. Okay, so if you'll you, you kind of see where he's going with this, what he's ultimately saying is that this distinction between the transcendent and the imminent, uh, the the infinite divide between us and God, is going to be the basis on which he appeals to the concept of divine determinism. Now, he never calls it that, but I am because that's what it is, okay? So he's going to ultimately argue for divine determinism, but any objections that you have against divine determinism are supposedly answered by this divide. And you have to ask yourself the question, if it's a sufficient answer, and then also, obviously, if it's biblical, most importantly. Take two individuals who are indisputably within the system. Let us call them Smith and Jones. Suppose further that Smith is bigger, taller, and stronger than Jones, and so he decides one day to start pushing Jones around. Because they are both inside the system, both living inside the same reality, there's no way for Smith to act freely on Jones, pushing him from behind, say, without that action being simultaneously a removal of freedom from Jones. It is like one billiard ball displacing another. The more Smith acts freely on Jones in this way, the less free Jones feels. If Smith and Jones are attempting to occupy the same space, the more freedom the one has, the less freedom the other does. If Smith is free to push Jones down, Jones loses his freedom of standing up. Now this is where our background assumptions and our definition of God are so important. If we assume that God is within the system, this simply turns him into a cosmic bully. It turns Smith into Zeus. He becomes the biggest, baddest, and strongest Smith possible, but in his treatment of Jones, he remains a bully. Or to revert to our other image, making one of the billiard balls much bigger doesn't give the smaller one any additional liberty. In short, by neglecting the creator-creature distinction, we create a situation where other Christians hear us talking about the quote-unquote sovereignty of God, and all they can imagine is a muscle-bound God bullying all of us. And if Okay, so hopefully his argument's clear in what he's trying to say. He's saying because God's outside of the bubble of reality, um, he's not just this muscle-bound bully pushing us around, doing physical violence against us. But again, even if we put Smith outside of that little circle that he drew earlier, and Smith somehow, some way, was causally determining the desires of Jones and any other quote-unquote bullies or evil actors within that circle, then I think the objection is still the same. In other words, there's still objectionable things being raised. So just by moving God outside the circle doesn't really change the objection, in my opinion. Now, Doug is going to make a, a further argument as to why it should, and you just have to ask yourself, are you convinced by his argument, and are they biblically based? Their background assumption were correct i.e. that God were somehow contained by the system, that would be a true problem. God would be a bully. Let us take the famous soliloquy from Hamlet, where Hamlet is deciding whether to be or not to be. Suppose we asked an odd question about the speech, and suppose that the question was this. What percentage of the speech was Hamlet, and what percentage of the speech came from Shakespeare? To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them. Try as we might, we are not going to be able to carve this speech up and assign different percentages of responsibility. We won't ever be able to say that it was 70-30 Hamlet Shakespeare, or 99-1 the other way. Considered on one level, it's all Shakespeare. And considered on another level, it is entirely Hamlet. Put bluntly, it is 100-100. In the realm of authorship, it is all Shakespeare. And within the play, considering the actions of the characters, it is all Hamlet. Okay, so this is very similar to the argument we heard from John MacArthur with regard to uh, the inspiration of the Book of Romans by Paul. And he asked the audience, who wrote the Book of Romans? 
And he kind of jokes with them a little bit about this is a simple question. Who wrote it? And some are saying Paul and some are saying God. And which is it? Is it God or Paul? And I, I think the answer is, is fairly simple. It's Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not a real difficult thing. And you can give 100% credit to God for inspiring Paul and Paul as being the instrument of authorship. But what makes that so unique and so uh, of God is because God is supernaturally interacting within our world to bring about the writing of Scripture. That's what makes it authoritative. Now, if you try to suppose that in the same way that God authored Scripture, he also brings about all things, then what you have just done is undermined the inspiration of Scripture because you've made it commonplace. You've made it everything of God. The book that I wrote was sovereignly and unchangeably ordained by God, even its errors, if they contain any errors. The books that Doug Wilson has written were sovereignly and unchangeably brought about by God. And he believes they're true, otherwise he wouldn't write them. So he calls the Bible true and divinely inspired, and he calls his own books true. And I guess he thinks they were sovereignly brought to pass, deterministically brought to pass by God. So in what manner can he call the book of Romans more authoritative than his own books, if he believes both of them to be true and sovereignly and unchangeably brought to pass by the creator? You see the point? Whenever you take things that are uniquely of God's intervention to bring about the writing of Scripture, for example, and you use them as examples of how God always works at all times, what you've done is you've undermined the authority of the means by which he brought about the authorship of Scripture. You've taken a unique way in which God does work and has worked, and you've made it commonplace. You've made it ununique. You've made it something that God does in every moment and every time, thus undermining the authority of the things that God actually does in our world. And so obviously we have some objections to the Hamlet analogy, okay? And I, I want to present some of these uh, objections because you're going to see this authorship analogy used quite regularly from men like Doug Wilson. And I think it falls apart for not only reasons that he goes on to confront, but for many other reasons namely of which, which he, he actually acknowledges that Hamlet's not a, a real person uh, with a real will of his own. And so in, in that actual analogy, Shakespeare's actually the only one who wrote the, uh, the Hamlet's uh, speech because Hamlet doesn't exist. Hamlet is a figment of Shakespeare's imagination. Um, and so uh, it doesn't work, but he's using it as an analogy. And I'm trying not to nitpick the analogy because what he's trying to do is demonstrate the author versus the actors or characters in the play and the distinction between the two worlds in which they live. And so I understand the point he is trying to get across. I just don't think the author uh, character, fictional character analogy is, is very helpful at this point for reasons that we'll go on to discuss as you listen to this. It is a lesser example of a creator-creature divide. Now, someone is going to object to the illustration, saying that it does not meet the problems inherent in the case. The reason beneath this objection is that we are three-dimensional living beings with hopes, dreams, and aspirations, and Hamlet is a two-dimension character out of a play entirely fictional. Okay, is that true? Yeah, obviously that that is just the truth of the matter. If, if Hamlet were to materialize into an actual sentient human being with feelings and emotions, and Shakespeare was a living deity of some sort uh, in some other transcendent world who was pinning uh, the existence of Hamlet and his uh, choices and actions, and, and then Hamlet was held accountable for the choices and actions that he did in the story by Shakespeare. In other words, Shakespeare set as a judge over Hamlet and judges him and says, well, here on page 39, you had this vengeful thought against your uncle and plotted to kill him. And so now you're going to go into the fire and burn. Okay. And Hamlet's going to say, wait a second. Uh, you mean that thing you authored me to do, that thing that you scripted for me to do, that, that thing, that, that's what you're going to burn me for now. And he's going to say, yes. And who are you to question me? Oh, character in the book that I'm writing and, and, and basically quote Romans nine out of its context for you, because you actually are just a character in the play. Um, the, the same objections that we have to the Calvinist, exactly the same kinds of objections 
that Hamlet would have against Shakespeare if Shakespeare were a real divine judge over his actions and choices. And, and therefore, the analogy itself doesn't really answer the problems of the objection in any, in any meaningful sense that I, that I can think of anyway. And I, and I can point to this uh, kind of in this, in this way. Earlier, you saw this diagram that he brought up in his analogy, saying God being above time, in a sense, or outside of time, as some people want to describe it that way, and creating everything that's within that realm of reality. Now, it's not saying that God's not real. It's the reality of the material world is what's in reference there. Um, and in the same way, the analogy is is pushing it kind of like this. Shakespeare is the author of everything in the world of Hamlet. And now it's interesting that Doug uses authorship when the, the Westminster, which later he's conf- he, he actually reads from, actually denounces and denies that God is the author of evil. And yet evil is within this world. And that he says he's not the author. And so he's using the very analogy that the very confession that he quotes from is denouncing, which I, I, I find uh, interesting, if nothing else. But this world of Shakespeare um, is is supposed to be analogous to what God is is doing. So Shakespeare is above and beyond the characters in his play. He is He is in another world, so to speak. He is in another realm of existence. In a lesser extent, obviously, I'm not trying to nitpick the analogy. I'm trying to be fair uh, with him by using this analogy. But I also want to point out where the analogy falls apart and really is inconsistent with it within itself and the nature of reality. Um, for example, you've got people like Doug, the determinist, in the world of Hamlet. Suppose there was a man named Doug in the play of Hamlet that Shakespeare authored. And Doug walks in and says, hey, Hamlet, um, you're created by a guy named Shakespeare who is writing a play. And everything you're saying right now was scripted by him before you existed. In fact, your existence is from Shakespeare and everything you're saying right now. In fact, everything that I, Doug, am saying to you, Hamlet, that's also scripted by Shakespeare, just so you know. Um, And by the way, Shakespeare's going to judge me for everything I'm saying right now, and he's going to judge you for everything you're saying right now and everything you're thinking or ever have thought or have done. Um, And I just want you to know that. I I just want to make sure you're aware that this is a scripted play and you're in it, okay? And Shakespeare's the one who authored me to tell you that because you don't know it yet, okay? So in other words, we want to make sure that the, the players in the play of Shakespeare all know they're actors in the play and that God, that that Shakespeare has scripted their words and actions. We just want to make sure everybody knows that because that needs to get out there. We just make sure that that's our mission to make sure everybody knows that Shakespeare authored this play. Okay. We want to make sure. Oh, but, but it goes further. He's also got a guy, let's say named William Lane Craig, for example, the libertarian, and he's going to have him and he's going to script him to come in and go, no, 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 <laughs> that's not right, Doug. Doug, that's not right. Hamlet, you need to know this. Hamlet, stop, stop, stop. Shakespeare created a world in which you can make free choices um, and your choices are free. The the vengeful feelings you have towards your uncle, that's yours. That's not from Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare is big enough and powerful enough to create a world where you can make your own choices and the things you've done up to this point in your life are not something he has scripted for you to do. You're free. And, 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 and Doug's over there going, you know, uh, William Lane Craig, that guy over there, uh, he's been scripted also by Shakespeare to say the things that he's saying. And he's scripting the things that I'm saying to you right now. And he's scripted everything you're thinking about the thoughts that we're telling you to think. And this dizzying vertigo sets in. You go, what are you talking about dizzying vertigo? Um, just what the, the, um, the William Lane Craig figure is saying. Uh, William Lane Craig puts it this way. A determinist cannot live consistently as though he thinks and does what he thinks and does is causally determined, especially his choice to believe that determinism is true. Thinking that you're determined to believe that everything you believe is determined produces a kind of vertigo. Nobody can live as though all that he thinks and does is determined by causes outside of himself. Even determinists recognize that we have to quote unquote act as if we have free will and so weigh our options and decide on what course of action to take even though the end of at the end of the day we are determined to take the choices we do determinism is thus an unlivable view 
In other words, it's not practical. It, it's no good for Shakespeare to write in Doug and William Lane Craig into his play. It, does, it doesn't serve the actors any good purpose. It just hurts them. It harms them. It keeps them from acting freely and being responsible and thinking that they're responsible for their choices. It could lead Hamlet to start thinking fatalistically and reacting fatalistically within the play itself, especially if he has the freedom to judge what Doug is saying to him and believe it to be true, which he will if Shakespeare authors him to do that. Okay, This presents, William Lane Craig says, a real problem, not just for the Calvinist, but for the naturalistic determinist as well, as well, insofar as naturalism implies that all our thoughts and actions are determined by natural causes outside ourselves, free will is just an illusion. But we cannot escape this illusion and so must go on making choices as though we had free will, even though apparently we don't. Naturalism is thus an unlivable worldview. So what ultimately Dr. Craig is saying is that both Calvinism, like naturalistic determinism, are unlivable, untenable, impractical, unhelpful worldviews. And therefore, there's no reason that Shakespeare would author a Doug into his play. And so that, that's why I'm pushing back on this. Also, as I think Doug will go on to address here, it doesn't address the real objection that non-determinists or indeterminists have against his determinism. What is that? Let's look at it just real quick, okay? Hopefully you can see that on the screen. Let me make that larger so that you can see this. Okay, so the first line is the is the line of the call of the determinist, right? The, the Calvinist. God, by means of divine decree, determines all people's decisions and actions. Now, I've color-coded this so that you can follow the line from each point because it does not change, okay? The subject, uh, uh, who, who does the determining, is in blue, um, what the means that they use to use to bring the determinations about is in yellow there, highlighted in yellow. The word determines is in red because in every single one of them, determination is taking place. Determinism is happening. And then in purple there are the objects being determined. Okay. So God, by means of divine decree, determines all his people's thoughts, actions, decisions, desires, everything meticulously is brought to pass by God. The potter, by means of molding, determines all pot's decisions, actions, and his shape, which is exactly the analogy that Paul uses. So how do you interpret that analogy? We'll get to that later. Hold that point. We're going to answer it because Doug is going to bring that up later in this broadcast. There's the programmer who has the avatar world or the robot world. Okay. So the programmer or the computer programmer or the computer, or the robot builder, either one, by means of programming, determines all the avatars or the robots' decisions and action in his avatar world. I, I think that the computer programmer analogy is a really good one for Doug because you've got the computer programmer who is in this world programming a avatar world on his computer screen that's in cyberspace, in the iCloud, so to speak. And so it's in a different reality. But what is happening there? The programmer is the one who's ultimately determining, programming, determining the robot shape his decisions, his actions, his his reactions, everything about what happens to this avatar in this avatar world that the programmer is meticulously determining. And so I think if any analogy fits this creator-creature distinction, uh, the creator of an avatar world would be one that would fit that, that avatar distinction, I would think. Uh, the puppeteer by means of strings, determines all puppets, decisions, and actions. An author, by means of scripting or writing, what determines every character's thoughts, actions, decisions, choices. So the author, uh, Shakespeare, by means of writing the play Hamlet, determines the character Hamlet's decisions, actions, and choices. That is the accusation, okay? That is the problem that we're having. So Regardless of which of these analogies one chooses to use, determinism maintains, and you have to answer the objection of the determinism, okay? Just by creating another analogy to, to make it sound more reasonable or more palatable to your audience doesn't answer the problem of determinism, and that's what we're pushing back on. Now, with that said, let's go back to the video from Doug and listen to what he, he goes on to say. The analogy fails, or so it is claimed. There are two responses to this. The first is to acknowledge the analogy does fail, but not in the way the objector thinks. 
In all the years that I've been using this illustration, no one has ever raised his hand in order to object that the analogy is weak because God is infinitely greater than Shakespeare. No, what catches our interest is how much greater than Hamlet we are. Our zeal is for our own glory and not God's glory. And this is why the analogy works. God is so much greater than Shakespeare that he can write a play that has three-dimensional characters in it, up to and including their ability to make free and responsible decisions. Okay, so notice what his, his appeal is. You can't imagine how Shakespeare can pull this off, but because God is so much greater than Shakespeare, it, he can do it. Well, we can make the same claim. You can't imagine how God uh, or how somebody could create a world with libertarianly free creatures who has all knowledge and all power, but God is much greater than the imagination of whatever being you think can't do that. And so we can appeal to the same thing and say, the creator God can actually create a reality and world where people make decisions that aren't determined by him. He's actually able to pull that off, even though you and your finite reasoning can't imagine how he does it. So if you want to appeal to the greatness of God, we can do so even more so in my estimation. And, and, and by saying, ultimately, you can't imagine how Shakespeare can pull this off. Well, in the same way, you can't imagine how God can pull this off to, to allow for his creatures not to be scripted in making their decisions. Uh, he, he doesn't have to script the decisions of the people he creates because he's not just an author writing fictional characters on a play that he's going to later hold accountable for their actions. Even though they were decisions that he wrote into the play. Okay, so uh, j I, I want to entertain some questions here. How does he do that? I have no idea. I don't know how he creates something from nothing. I believe that he does. Do I have to know how God does something in order to believe that he does it? No. I believe that God knows what I'm going to eat tomorrow at lunch, even though I don't even know what I'm going to eat tomorrow at lunch. I don't know how he knows that. I believe that he does. Okay. Is it possible for me to know that God knows something without knowing how he does it? The Calvinist steps in and goes, no, we know how he knows it. He knows it because he's micromanaged it. He's scripted it. He's determined you to, what you're going to eat tomorrow. That's how he knows it. So for Calvinist, what they have to do is to say only way God knows it. We have to, we have to describe the how. Calvinists have to know what the how is. The how is he determines it. He scripts it. That's how Shakespeare knows what Hamlet's going to do tomorrow. He scripts it for Hamlet. And that's the only way that he can know it. And, and, and they impose that upon God. It's the only way God can know what Leighton's going to choose to eat tomorrow for lunch is if somehow God scripts it. He determines it. And I'm just saying, I don't believe that's cr the, the case. I don't believe God has to determine my actions in order to know them. I think that's what is supernatural about his infinite qualities, like omniscience. He knows it because he's God, not because he determines it. I don't equate causality with knowledge. I don't think because God, somebody knows something, therefore they must have determined it. I don't think that there's a connection there. I think that's conflating necessity with certainty. Just because something's certainly known, it doesn't have to be necessitated, i.e. determined by the one who knows it. I think that's a philosophical error. And I think that's a very low view of God, just so that you're aware. I mean, again, either God's determined for me to think that determinism is a very low view of God, or it really is. It's one, one of the two. The second response is that, as analogies go, it is perfectly scriptural. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. Jeremiah 18, 5. Okay, so Jeremiah 18, let's look at that because the biblical side of it, that's my bread and butter. That's where I always want to go. The philosophical side, you know, I'll, I'll punt to William Lane Craig's and other trained philosophers in the world who want to get into more of the, the, the hows of the scripture that the Bible doesn't give us direct hows uh, on. And that's where philosophy oftentimes steps in, which there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying I'm more of trained in the theology and biblical exegesis. And so that's what I, I want to look at. So let's look at Jeremiah 18, and can it be used in the way that uh, Doug is using it here? Let's, let's look at it uh, bigger on the screen so that you can see it. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something on a wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in his hands. Okay, I'm going to mark that right there because that word spoiled in his hands is really key here. D 
did the potter make a mistake? Calvinists. Did the potter mess up here? The, the, the clay he's making here, it says it was spoiled in his hands. Does it say, does it say there that the potter messed up or does it blame it on the clay? No, it's the clay. The clay was spoiled in his hands. What does that represent? When a person, if the clay pot is representing people, when the people of Israel begin to go bad, when, when, and this actually happens, I've talked to a potter before who actually does, he messaged me when I wrote my book and, and actually said, yes, there's actually uh, flaws that can happen within the clay itself. That's not the potter's fault. Because normally you would think if there's some error that's made, the potter's just messed up. Clay's all the same. And he's, he's saying, no, no, clay can actually spoil. It can go bad. And so that's that's exactly what this is saying here. So this this he's the potter has an intention. I'm going to use this, this particular lump for a good purpose. I'm going to mold this into something for a good purpose. But it spoils in his hand. Okay. Now, does the potter have the right to then remold the spoiled lump of clay into a common vessel? in order to bring about his purpose through this vessel's uh, error, in other words, still accomplish a good purpose through the evil, moral evil, or the bad shape or the bad quality of this particular lump of clay? Does, does the potter have the right to do that? Exactly. Yes, absolutely. Which is exactly what Romans 9 gets into with the nation of Israel who has spoiled in his hands and i.e. become uh, calloused and hardened like sticks in the mud, like old wine skin that can't take the new wine, you know, self-righteous. He can take that spoiled lump and shape it and mold it to cry out, crucify him, bring us Barabbas. So as to bring about his plan of redemption through their evil actions. Can God do that? Of course, he's the potter. He can use the spoiled lump of clay however he wants to, but it's not God's doing to make them spoiled. That was their own free choice. They did that. They didn't have to go that way. That was their choice. That's our argument. So spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. So because they spoiled, because they went evil, it's perfectly within the potter's right to remake and use that vessel in their evil ways for a good purpose. That's the point. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, am I not able, house of Israel, to deal with you as the potter does? Declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, house of Israel. At one, mo at one moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot it, tear it down or destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns, so this is an if-then statement, it's a contingency. If that nation of pots turns, that's a responsibility of their potter, pottery. In other words, just because he's using the analogy of potter clay doesn't mean that the pottery doesn't have responsibility here. If if those if that pot, if those that pottery turns from its evil way, that thing which spoiled it in the first place, I will relent of the remolding for disaster that I've planned to bring upon it. Or at another moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build it up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, as if the pot has responsibility here again, then I will relent of the good which I said that I would bless it. So now speak to the men of Judah. And he goes on. Okay. So that's the context of that, which he's quoting from. Now let's go on with the video and see uh, what else uh, application he brings to this. Six. If we have our feathers ruffled by being compared to a two dimensional literary figure, then what about being compared to a clay pot? We are greater than Hamlet, certainly, but we are much greater than a clay pot. And God is greater than both a playwright and a potter. Okay, and this is one of the arguments I've made several times. Back when I was a Calvinist, when somebody would use the puppet analogy or the robot analogy, I would say, oh, well, puppets can ma be made to look real pretty. Um, robots can be made to look beautiful. Avatars can be made to look amazing, even better than what people look like. Um, God compares us, I said, when I was a Calvinist, to mud is the way I use it, mud. And so, hey, you want to complain if you want to use pottery. I mean, you don't want to use pottery and clay pots and mud. And you would rather, you know, make ourselves. I mean, God's analogy is it makes man much worse than even your analogy does. And that's the way I handled people who would use robots and puppets in in response to me, where a lot of people today will will tr try to say, oh, we're nothing like robots. We're nothing like puppets and 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 try to 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 denounce or separate themselves from those analogies. 
um, instead of just embracing it, which is exactly what Doug seems to be doing here is, uh, you know, hey, if you're going to object to being compared to a a two-dimensional figure in a play, then how dare you? Because God compared us to mud. And so you you shouldn't even object at all. Um, But again, is it carrying the analogy too far? And is it supposed to supposedly comparing us uh, deterministically to pots in the same way, uh, in other words, that you have no more control over your decisions and your choices than ultimately a pot has over its shape and its use is basically the application that people like Doug are bringing to Romans 9 and other texts like in Jeremiah is that ultimately a pot has no control over its shape and its use, no more so than you have control over your decisions and actions in the hand of the creator God. And that you just have to ask yourself, is that the proper application of the use of the analogy in scripture? I say it's not based upon the actual reading of the scripture and exegesis of the scripture, giving us contingencies. If the clay pots do this, I will relent in my in what I plan for the its shape. And if you do this, then I, I will do this. In, in fact, I, I forgot to read this, but Paul brings that same analogy in, in another text, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. In a large house, there are not only gold and silver implements, but also implements of wood and earthenware, clay pots. That's what earthenware is. Some are for honor, some are for dishonor. Does that sound familiar? Sounds like the exact same analogy he uses in Romans 9. Some pots form for honor, some for dishonor. But, you know, clay pots have no choice as to which one they'll be used for, right? They have no real responsibility, right? Therefore, Paul says in verse 21, if anyone, talking about a person who's being compared to earthenware, if any earthenware cleanses himself from these things, what's cleansing himself mean? Exactly what Jeremiah 18 says, turn from the evil you did, obey me, turn from evil, repent. Anyone who cleanses himself from these things, he will be an implement for honor. In other words, the potter will decide how he shapes and use the pot depending upon the pot's reaction and response in obedience and faith and repentance. That's the application of the script. That's exegesis, Okay not determinism read over the scripture and just assuming that we have no more control over our decisions and choices and actions and repentance than a clay pot has over its shape and use in the hand of a potter. Read the analogy for how it's actually applied in the scripture. If anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be an implement for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for good work. So what is the responsibility of the clay pot? To repent, humble yourself, so as to be lifted up, to be used for honor, which is repeated in almost every single book of the Bible over and over and over again, calling ourselves to humble ourselves, to repent, to throw ourselves at the mercy, to believe in God, to trust in him, and then we will be used for honor. 